Well, good morning, 8th grade Old Testament survey Bible class. It was good seeing your faces today on the Teams live video. I'm sorry that uh, I didn't get that uh, video started promptly or even completely. So moving forward, hoping to do a better job at getting the technological side of things worked uh, out. Uh, you remember in the last couple of videos, we have looked at the book of First Kings. So quick review just to get you thinking again in Old Testament terms. Uh, First Kings covers two, or is, it can be broken up in two main pieces. Uh, 1 through 11 is the reign of Solomon. 12 through 22 is the reign of Solomon's sons. Chapter 12 being that very uh, influential key moment in First Kings where one kingdom becomes two kingdoms so that would be 12 let's say remember 12 maybe one of the most important moments in israel's history the landscape of the nation we can't even call it the single nation of israel is forever changed after first kings chapter 12. Uh, remember rehoboam is uh, a fool and says foolish things and the people divide and Jeroboam takes the tribes in the north. Rehoboam stays in the south with Judah. And so you have Israel in the north, and the, and the capital is Sumeria. You have Judah in the south, and its capital is Jerusalem. And basically every book from this point onward lives life in light of that reality. So when they talk about uh, such and such a prophet, prophesied during the reign of such and such a king in Samaria or in Jerusalem. That's going to tell you whether this is a northern or a southern um, prophet, uh, who he ministered to, the time he ministered during, and, and all of that. In today's video, in the time we have remaining, I want to look at the book of 2 Kings. Now, you should have your 2 Kings handout. Uh, or content page and so you can look through that take a few minutes and familiarize yourself with the kind of ebb and flow of the different kings who have ruled during the reign of second kings or during the the book of second kings rather and uh, three key transitions or events happen in the book of second kings i want you to see them all Remember to be taking good notes in a Word document if you're able and submitting those along with your homework. So turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. Remember that the primary prophetic voice in Israel at this point has been the prophet Elijah. He kind of shows up during the reign of um, Ahab and is he's the guy in Israel speaking on God's behalf. Now there's a transition that's going to come as he hands off the ministry to Elisha. These are the two main prophets of this era. Uh, you, you do need to know them and you need to know kind of how that transition happens. Um, 2 Kings 2, if you have your Bibles open, uh, there's a, a request made from Elisha. Verse 9, And when they'd crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let me let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. He's asking what you were as a prophet. May that be uh, how I live, how I minister, uh, and how I serve the Lord and serve Israel. And Elijah said to him, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am taken from you, it shall be for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses, that will be a theme that will come up again in the ministry of Elisha regarding uh, events at the city of Dothan, if memory serves me correctly. Um, there were chariots of fire and horses, and they separated the two of them. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind, or tornado, and was taken into heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. 
And then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank. So he, here you've witnessed the handing off of the ministry or the office of prophet from Elijah to Elisha. Very dramatic. Elijah is one of the few people um, in the Bible, like maybe one of two, uh, depending on how you understand some uh, a passage in um, in Genesis. One of the only two that we don't read of them dying. He was literally taken up into heaven by a fiery chariot. And now the office of prophet lies squarely on the shoulders of, of Elisha. Uh, he's got all of the main stories that we would remember of him, uh, him ministering to the the widow and supplying her with um, food miraculously, raising a son from the dead, healing uh, the general of the Syrian army, Naaman of leprosy, again, showing uh, uh, looking ahead that God's eye is on the nations, not just on Israel. Um, and then you run into, so that that's the first of the main three events, the handing off of the prophetic office. So if you want to think of the second half of first Kings, that's the ministry of Elijah. If you want to at least think of the, well, I don't know about first half, maybe, but roughly first half of the book of Second Kings. That's Elisha. So, if you were to be asked, when did the rain, when did the uh, rule or the um, when was the time of Elijah and Elisha? Well, Elijah, second half of First Kings. Elisha, first half of second, first half, second half of First Kings. That's not confusing. And first half of Second Kings would be Elisha. Then you get Jehu. Uh, who is one of my favorite characters in uh, all of the Bible? He is um, he is <laughs> he is a wild a wild guy. He is uh, not someone you should model your life after, and. Um, I'm looking for a verse. Yeah, so here it, here it is. 2 Kings 9. Uh, I'll just give you a, a little glimpse at what kind of a person Jehu was. We don't get to get too distracted. He's the person that God uses to kill Jezebel, more or less, or give the command to kill Jezebel and deal justice with her. 2 Kings 9, 17. So here, Jehu is coming against uh, Joram and Ahaziah. And uh, he is not coming in peace. He's coming in war. Now the watchman was standing. This is verse 17 of chapter 9. Now the watchman was standing on the tower in Jezreel. And he saw the company of Jehu as he was coming. And he said, I see a company. And Joram said, take a horseman and send to meet him and say, is it peace? So a man on horseback went to meet him and said, thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu said, what do you have to do with peace? Turn and ride behind me. So this guy now joins forces with Jehu. And the watchman reported, saying the messenger reached them, but he is not coming back. Then he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, Thus says the king who, um, who has said, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What have you to do with peace? Turn and ride behind me. The second horseman joins Jehu. Jehu must be quite the commanding figure. And again, the watchman reported, he reached them, but he's not coming back. And notice this. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. <laughs> That's 2 Kings 9, verse 20. I don't know how much variation in chariot driving existed in this time period in the nation of Israel. But apparently Jehu <laughs> drove his chariot in a furious manner, was known for his furious driving, and, uh, and that's how they recognized him well before he ever got to the city, was that he drove angry. Um, so you can see a little bit maybe why I like Jehu. God uses him. Even then, he's a, uh, he is not a 
good guy. He, he does many good things, but there's he's a mixed bag of bad things as well. Chapter 17 is our second. I, I could just get lost in some of these stories, but we got to keep going. Chapter 17. You're going to want to take uh, careful notes on this because uh, it's probably going to be the question I'm going to ask you. In the 12th year of Ahaz, king of Judah, so southern kingdom, Hoshea, the son of Elah, began to reign in Sumeria, northern tribe. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, yet not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Against him came up Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, and Hoshea became his vessel and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to uh, what looks like a, to a guy. So, S-O. Hmm. King of Egypt and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done the year, year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria and for three years besieged it. That is a long siege. Three years of slowly dying. Verse 6. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria, and he placed them in Hala on, and on the harbor, the river Gozan, and in the city of the Medes. Now notice the reason for this. This is one of the first main moments where you see the decline of the nation. Notice the reason, verse 7. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the customs of the nations who the Lord had driven out, or who the Lord drove out before the people of Israel, and in the customs of the kings of Israel, uh, that Israel had practiced. And the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in their towns, from watchtower to fortified city, they set up for themselves pillars and asharim on every high hill and, on, and under every green tree. And there they made offerings in the high places as the other nations did whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked things provoking Yahweh to anger. And they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways, and keep my commandment and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I command your fathers, and I, or that I, sent to you by my servant and prophets. But they did not listen, but they were stubborn as their fathers had been, who did not believe in the Lord their God. They despised his statutes and his covenants that he had given their fathers and the warnings that he had given them. They went after false idols and became false. They followed the nations that were around them concerning them whom the Lord had commanded. Isn't that the theme that we have been tracing down? Or not the singular theme, but the main one. You become like what you worship. So notice the way that the author of 2 Kings put it. They served false idols, and like their idols, they became false. You become like what you worship. We've also seen that if you follow God and obey his laws, you will succeed as a nation. You'll be blessed. If you follow after idols, you will be defeated. You'll be destroyed. Israel for generations of kings, king after king after king after king, and God is sending them prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet, pleading with them to turn away from idolatry and to worship God rightly. They refuse, and finally, God sends them into exile. Now, there's a key in that, in that section of verses. I want you to read over them on your own to answer this question. Chapter 17. The deportation of Israel. The connection is made 
that Israel is now no different than the people that they displace from Canaan or from the promised land. Uh, Israel goes in and God uses Israel as judgment for those pagan peoples that offer their children to Molech and to the other the um, other idols that they worship. Their iniquity had, had reached such a point that God now uses Israel to judge them. So he brings in Israel as a foreign nation to judge idolaters. And now the great tragic irony, now that's happening to Israel. Her idolatry, like the Canaanites, had reached such a point that God must judge. He whistles and calls Assyria. And Assyria destroys them, carries them off into exile, and puts them there. Now, I will, I will argue as we go through the rest of the Old Testament and into the New, Israel never fully comes back from exile. Now, you might say, well, what is Ezra about? What is Nehemiah about? What are... Um, What's going on in the New Testament when Israel's back in the land? Well, they do come back. But they never come back the same as what they were when they left. There's something different about the temple when they come back. There's a peace of Israel that always stayed in Assyria or Babylon or a piece of Assyria or Babylon that came back with Israel might be more like it. So when Christ comes onto the scene in the New Testament, the language used is that Israel is in many ways, at least spiritually, still in exile. They still are acting like they are a deported people. When you worship idols, you become like them. And God must judge second thing and we're out of time so i'll just briefly mention it turn to the end of the book chapter 25 and in the ninth year of his reign in the tenth month and on the tenth day of that month nebuchadnezzar king of babylon came with all of his army against jerusalem and laid siege to it and they built siege works all around it so the city was besieged till the eleventh year of king zedekiah on the ninth day of the fourth month the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for all the people. And a breach was made, verse 4. So, here you find in, in the book of Second Kings, the account, ver, or chapter 17, Israel, the northern tribes go into exile um, to Assyria. A couple, like, almost 200, well, 150-ish years later, um, Judah goes into exile with Babylon. So Shalmaneser from Assyria comes and takes the northern tribes away. Nebuchadnezzar comes uh, from Babylon and takes the southern tribes away. And when we get to the end of 1 Kings, everything we've been building for towards a king, towards a land, towards a temple, towards a, a place where they worship, it's all destroyed. So if what you're looking for is a nation here on the earth. Second Kings is a real bummer of a book. But if what we are looking for is a king, a king better than all these other kings, a land better than these lands, a government better than these governments, well, then Second Kings really does pave the way for the greatest of kings for the coming of Christ who will change the hearts of his people who will root out idolatry from Israel and Jacob and make them his own so three key events in review three key events in second kings chapter 2 Elijah hands off the office of prophet to Elisha Chapter 17, Israel is taken to captivity to Assyria. You need to know that. In chapter 25, Judah is taken into captivity uh, to Babylon.